Hey everybody, it's Rob with National Fire Radio. I'm here with our co-host uh, and uh, of our new show, Rush the Bus. So I'm going to do some introductions real quick. We've got Julian Peter. Say hi. hi. Hello. And then we have our guest tonight, uh, who I don't know anything about, but this is going to be <laughs> awesome because Julian Peter vouched for. So oh, yeah, like that's what I'm excited about. But uh-huh. Nancy's here. Nancy, what's your what's your full name? Nancy, uh, Nancy Guillem. And, and you work for? Um, I'm a lieutenant at Siege 57 for the uh, fire department. Okay, awesome. Yeah. All right. New York City. So, so Nancy, hi. Hi. <laughs> so, um, so we're starting a podcast called Rush the Bus, and um, we're trying to get stories of people who've been on the ambulance mm-hmm. and um, what their career's been like, what it's like being on the ambulance <laughs> and talking in front of a microphone. Oh, there yeah. you go. <laughs> so, um, tell us a little bit about yourself, Nancy. When, when did you start? I started when start in 1988. 1988. <laughs> um, my. Uh, Mom moved to Florida, so I had to get a job, and uh, this was in the news. <laughs> and uh-huh. It was okay. in the paper, which is how we got jobs back then. Okay. And um, my, uh, they trained me. They be- I went to par- EMT school with them. I became oh. a paramedic through them, okay. and they trained me to be a lieutenant. So everything I've done is completely on them. Okay. Like they, <laughs> they're responsible on. for everything. I did nothing <laughs> on the outside, nothing. Wow. So you it's came on when, what, co- what, what was the... With health and hospitals, right? Yeah, it was health and hospitals. Oh, wow. We were green, and uh, it was a very unflattering uniform. We had to buy our own. Okay. Wow. And it was a white shirt, which is ridiculous. <laughs> and uh, they all get, and because we bought our own, we didn't have that many. So yeah. the white shirts got really grungy looking at some point. And, you know, you didn't want to replace them because we you know, earned new, you know, it was like you yeah. had to buy your, you know, and I was really young then yeah. with an apartment and, uh, Bought four shirts. <laughs> yeah. Nancy, what, you, so kind of give me a little bit of the history because I, I know New York City EMS and then, you know, the I, I call it the transition. Yeah. But um, what, so you started, it was health and... Health and hospitals. And we worked, it was basically, it's a separate agency out of uh, the Health and Hospitals Corporation. It was basically a forgotten unit in a corner of their paperwork somewhere. And uh, we worked, I worked out of uh, a little tiny station at a belt at a Bellevue Hospital, which is now Station 8, eight, eight, eight I believe. Okay. And um, it was very small, and uh, there were about four stations, I think, in Manhattan at the time, and they were mostly hospital-based. Um, one of them was Metropolitan in Harlem, and then there was uh, Gouverneur downtown, which wasn't really a hospital anymore when I really started. Oh, that's over but by it. Cherry Street, right? Yeah. It's, it's, it's hidden it's back in there. Yeah, okay. and now it's, uh, it's, it's a separate outpost. Nursing outpost. home. Nursing yeah. home. It's, yeah. Like, yeah. it's really <laughs> posh-looking. Yes. <laughs> yeah. The city's changed yeah. very much in a short so period of time. Yeah. When you first came out, so they trained you to be an EMT, yes. health and hospitals. Uh-huh. How it long was it? Oh, it was it was really actually a long time. Um, when I started, they told us to show up on February 1st, Kay. and I quit my job yeah. and showed up on February 1st. What and time did you have to be there? Uh, 7 o'clock. Okay. And, um, and then they told us all to come back in a month. Oh my God. So wait, so you quit your job. Yes. They told you to be at seven o'clock. <laughs> yes, we and then showed you up. said come back in a come month. Come back in a month. Wow. And then uh, and a month later right. it started um in March first right. March first. What'd you do in the month? I got a temporary job. <laughs> <laughs> and you? that was actually you really good. I worked in an office for uh it was a journalist uh uh, they, they put out magazines for okay. various trades okay. and stuff like that. And that was a really decent job. And yeah. they were like, come and, you know, come to us full time. And yeah. I was like, no, no, I'm going to go on the ambulance. Right. <laughs> and they're like, really? Yeah. You're going to do that? Yeah. And I said, yeah, yeah. And then, Did um, you have to pay for a filing back then? Or it was just like, please come. Uh, yeah, I, I didn't have to pay for anything. Okay. Um, I remember I came in and uh, like the first day we took a test. There were like 80 people okay. that came up and they all took a test and it was I was like, oh, nervous. They're going <laughs> to yeah. give us a math test, and yeah. they're going to give us, uh, you know, a reading. And, yeah. and it was kind of ridiculously easy. And I thought, oh, this is a trick question, you know, <laughs> or something. And no, yeah. but a lot of people failed it. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, yeah, and, and then the rest of us all became a, a bunch of cadet classes. I remember it was five, six, and seven out of that, okay. that group. Yeah. Came and then I was one of six. Do you, remember, nice. how, do you uh, remember how many people were in your class when you came out? Um, it was like 40. It was very oh, big. It was, it was a decent size. And, um, yeah, it was, and uh, some of those people are still working. <laughs> really? Well, like Bastine. <laughs> oh, he's from your class, Yes, too? Bastine wow. was in my class. Okay. And, um, actually, not that many are working now. Yeah. But All right, so he, well, he's almost done. I know <laughs> yes. he's counting yeah. his days. Yeah, I know. So, oh, short my. Time yeah. <laughs> so you oh. came out and you, with the green uniforms, yes. the green pants guys. Yeah. And so you came out, and where'd you go from there? I went to Bellevue, and I spent all my VLS time at, at Bellevue. Okay. And it was uh, about eight or nine years VLS. And then um, I was to a two BLS. I was to a three 
ALS, yeah, and <laughs> now I'm tour. We're well, then tour one. And <laughs> what's <laughs> what's the tour? Yeah, what were your tours, um, Ron? Well, uh, no, I mean, like, you, the tour, like you said, tour one, tour two, tour. Tour like one is the, uh, is the evening. It's the overnight, and okay. uh, tour two is the daytime, and tour three is the evening. Okay. And I worked nine to five. BLS, which in and Manhattan. And you were coming from where? Oh my gosh. I, I lived in Queens for and then Brooklyn for some of it. It was oh, like just like yeah, it was old and Yo, crazy. What time do we for work in the morning? Oh yeah, my no, god, right. probably like seven. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, it was terrible. I used to get there very early just because it was. Did you mutual? Or when I mean mutual, did you do? Like I didn't. I didn't so really you mutual. Swap with I just else. stayed. Uh, and I loved my partners. Okay. So that's why I stayed with it. And longevity with partners isn't very common in our yeah. job. You yep. know, like there's you two that. I know she was my longest one. Yeah, I know. Yeah. They get arrested. Or yeah. <laughs> 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 they get arrested. They go on. Well, everybody quit. leaves. And they oh go no, somewhere else. Me. But my yeah. my BLS partner, I had one BLS partner for the entire duration, mm. and uh, he just retired like two years ago or something like that. And uh, my ALS partners were very long term, yeah. and now I've known Neil for yeah, <laughs> yeah. Which five is or great. six years. You know, yeah. I feel like it makes the job enjoyable when yeah, you have a good exactly. rapport with somebody. You know. I agree. It was a lot of fun. My partners, uh, actually, when my BLS partner was very fun to work with. And um, I was kind of, you know, like, uh, when I become ALS, this is going to end. But it didn't. It just yeah. got better. I had yeah. more people that were yeah. fun to be yeah. with and fun to do things with. And so what were the ambulances like back then? Oh, my God. I remember you told us some <laughs> stories a few weeks ago. There was, like, carpet I in the know. back or something. I think yeah, it's, it's yeah. kind of funny because the, the, Some of them you know. had wood panel. You know, <laughs> yeah. 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 Like the brown. We had this awful console with carpet on it, which <laughs> never gets clean. Yeah. Is it in the back or the front? That was in the front. Oh. That was in the front. And um, they, uh, they, they, they sent you out with fumes, uh, no air conditioning. There was no such a thing as a radio in the front that worked. You know, like it, music radios? Or like yeah, music radios. Okay. We had these little buttons that we used to push to tell if we were you know, on scene or going to the hospital okay. or something like that. And, uh, That's you want to hear tech. one of my stories about the intercom system? Come on, tell us about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, right. uh, I, I think it brings like great... Um, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it brings some, some good history, too. It's like there's... You know, the one thing that I have found in doing EMS is that we don't tell the story of what happened. Like, I don't, you know, I mean, mm-hmm. I only know from when I started, and I think it was like 98, 99 was when I, I we'll do math later, but, yeah. um, <laughs> and, and a little bit before that from mm-hmm. when my mom volunteered and, and whatnot. So, like, it, I think it's great to capture, like, what the, like the intercom and all this stuff, yeah. because this is something that people <laughs> yeah, don't else. don't know about. Yeah. Like, they're I know. Well, the only thing that has the intercom is the rescue truck now. Yeah, and... Like, it makes kind of sense for the rescue truck because they're kind of separated from yep. the front and the back. But it didn't really make sense because you have that little square. You can hear okay. everything between that little yeah. square. You know, it's big enough to <laughs> crawl through if you lose your keys, yeah. you know, and you can go in there. But um, <laughs> we had, uh, you know, an intercom for s- some of them came out with this. And uh, it was just, a, you know, there and nobody used it. But my partner, he was pretty innovative and he was a lot of fun. <laughs> and he could imitate anybody's voice. He was really good at prank phone calls. And... Um, I don't know. We had one day that uh, we had some regular that was very mean to us yeah. all the time. And uh, I don't know if he was homeless or not, but he was just a regular of ours. He was mean. And at the time, there was a hospital in Manhattan that had, like, some sort of, like, sales pitch of, like, um, we go the extra mile. Or I'm not really sure. I don't remember <laughs> the uh, I don't remember the pitch. But they wanted people to going to their hospital, which is kind of funny because the nurses there were never very – receptive to that like <laughs> they didn't up you know the meaning of their slogan yeah <laughs> everybody in the in the world in the hospital world wants you to bring patients there except the nurses in the er yeah <laughs> you know yeah. And yeah. why do you bring this patient yes yeah. How dare <laughs> like, you? i don't know i know this is a hospital. and so uh, <laughs> yeah this guy wanted to go to that hospital because he had seen the ads on television and or the whatever it was maybe radio and uh he wanted to go to that hospital and uh we we're like all right whatever we'll go there so, you know, still, uh, I want to point out that he was mean to us and deserved <laughs> this, it. you know. Yeah. So um, we're going to the hospital. It was a decent ride, and uh, my partner's driving, and just suddenly, like, the intercom starts working, and he did, like, an old woman's voice, <laughs> and he said, hello there, Mr. Uh, Smith. Um, and uh, he's like, what's that, you know? And, and she's like, well, I'm going to call her she just because that's who, you know, she's pretending to be. And... Um, you know, she said, uh, this is uh, Harriet. I work in the kitchen at, you know, Hospital XYZ. Um, we're here to take your lunch order. And he <laughs> said, uh, my lunch order? And she goes, yeah, you know, we go the extra mile. And, uh, you know, we, we, we think a well-fed patient is a healthy patient. 
and um, he had the three choices. So he chose like pork chops and mashed potatoes. Oh my god! And uh, something, <laughs> you know, a dessert, <laughs> some sort of full meal, a full meal. And you know, and he and he just looked at me afterwards, and he's like, "You see, that's why I want to go to this hospital." And so then you, you look know, a scorn like, "Yeah, yeah this is yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you should take all your patients here." So my and then, you know my partner goes on the intercom and goes okay your your order number is like one two three four just remember that one two three four so he said okay and uh, have a nice day you know and uh, so the rest of the ride you know he's just like oh I'm gonna get fed I you know pork chops blah 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 and I just didn't know what to make of it I, you know I never, he never did this before it was just out of the blue we didn't rehearse it it just came out of nowhere so I don't I, I didn't know what to make of it but I was like whatever so we get to the hospital we take him out of the vehicle. And uh, my partner's like, oh, did you order lunch, you know? <laughs> and uh, he's like, yes. He's like, yeah, this place, they make really good food. You know, when you're in the middle of the um, restaurant district, they, they order this stuff out from, like, top top chefs, you know? <laughs> and uh, he's like, great, yeah. He's like, I ordered the pork chops. And he goes, the pork chops are really wonderful here. You're going to be very happy with them. Uh -huh. And then we get closer to the entrance, and he's like, I'm just going to tell you something, though. He says, you know, the nurses here like the food, too. And they're going to tell you that you're not entitled to a lunch. <laughs> oh, my gosh. But you've got an order number, right? <laughs> and he says, yes, one, two, three, four. He's like, you make sure you let them know that you ordered your lunch. <laughs> and you're entitled to it. And uh, <laughs> and he's like, thanks. Thanks for the advice. <laughs> and so uh, he's like, when do I get my food? And they're like, after you're registered, which is long after we're gone. You yeah. Know, so <laughs> Did you come back and see him? Yes, we saw him later. He was screaming and yelling and... Uh, He's like, you know, he's like, I know that you probably <laughs> had my lunch. You know, you look like you enjoy a good plate of pork chops, oh, you know. Oh. And the nurses were like, I don't know what's up with this man. <laughs> he thinks he's getting fed here. We don't feed people unless they're admitted. And he's just going to be leaving in it. Wow. <laughs> You know, but whatever they they deserved it. She deserved it. You <laughs> he couldn't, deserved yeah, it. You know. Do that <laughs> no, he no, probably couldn't get away with that. You know. On us quick. Yeah. <laughs> and that was Manhattan. You know, yeah. like yeah. that was big. The light shine on you, and yeah, you know. <laughs> well, I always thought it was funny. Like I know a, a couple people um, <clears throat> who work EMS in in New York City uh, outside of Julian and Peter, and um, like we were walking. I think, uh, I don't know if we were, we were down in the city drinking for something. It might've been like a bachelor party or mm -hmm. something. And they're all like, I'll keep moving. And I'm like, what? And I get to the other side of the street. And I'm like, why? And they're like, and that's uh like, there's a concerned citizen squad and oh. they don't understand. <laughs> and I'll just use the name Hector as like a mm -hmm. gender, but that, that's Hector. And he's always here mm -hmm. and they're going to call. And then like, we're going to show up and they're going to want us to give life-saving treatment to him. But he's <laughs> just always drinking. Yeah. Uh, so and like, it's just like, Know. Shifted yeah. across the side of the street, but it goes back to that what we can and can't do, and what the expectation of us is now. But I don't know where it came from. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's a, a different different world. I know. Well, now everyone has cell phones too, so I feel like um, you know the kind of like call for the unconscious type has probably gone yeah. up quite a bit because of uh, do gooders who think like, oh, this person's in the street; they must need an ambulance. Mm -hmm. um, They're on the subway. <laughs> in the station, yeah, and then you run a, a goose chase. So I, yeah. I, I bet you it happens everywhere. But it does, uh, yeah, it, it, because everybody has their phone. I think back in the day, maybe in the eighties or nineties, not everyone was willing to walk to a payphone to call for the guy who's like sleeping on the subway car. But now mm. they're most definitely going to yeah, call for that person. Uh -huh. What are I mean, having like starting out in eighty eight? What are some of the um, some of the industry changes that you've seen that are like like oh. that just kind of like. I don't know, like, just, do you have an opinion on any of them? Or? I mean, I think it's vastly improved in a big, huge way. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm not one of the people who thinks that the fire department takeover was a bad thing. I think it gave us some um, better credibility. We weren't, we were no longer, you know, the stepchildren of health and hospitals. And it's, I, I think it's a better stepchild of the fire department just because, um, you know, there's, they recognize that we're still an emergency service. It's being part of the hospital-based system. It has, uh, you know, there's a sense to that, but, you know, our care for them ends when we drop them off. We, spend, we don't spend our time in the ER. We don't really continue the care in the hospital setting, you know, and um, it's just um, to, to treat us as, as an emergency service is, is more um, appropriate than to treat us as a hospital service just because... They're all cleaned up by the time they get to the hospital. Yeah. The hospital, the way they treat patients is from a, 
you know, the starting points of when we drop them off. And uh, they're like, that's, it, it's a different kind of care. Like, they don't have to deal with the outside elements and the logistical issues. Right. And, um, you know, there's a lot of, like, extrication issues and cleanup that they don't really seem yeah. to understand happens beforehand. And, you know, the carrying and... I, I will. Oh, oh sorry. sorry. I just. Uh, no, I was just going to say, we had a, a patient the other night where I felt like I we had to reiterate, like, several times over to the doctor, like, because she couldn't really understand what the scenario was, like, what's mm -hmm. going on here. Everybody and told her, too. And, and I mean, felt, yeah. you know, we like had a, a giant patient who was completely naked, like, writhing on the floor, and he was hypoxic, which means he wasn't getting enough oxygen. Uh, he also had a GI bleed, so he was, like, pooping blood, pretty much, mm -hmm. um, and then essentially rolling around in it. So it was like, we're trying to help this person, but, like, we literally can't get our hands on him. I mean, we're already getting covered in stuff, you know? Um, and then we had to sedate him because we couldn't, like, safely handle him, like, for him or for us right. to be safe. And mm -hmm. then when we took him to the hospital, like, while we were in the truck, he ended up going into respiratory arrest and then eventually cardiac arrest. And we got to the hospital, and we're explaining it, and, and the doctor had to come out, and she kept asking, well, was this, like, an asthma? And we're like, no, you know, no, like, it's, like, he had a GI bleed, and mm -hmm. this is what it was. And she was like, yeah, but why, why is this, like, where, like, it was, like, the question she was asking, I was like, I, I finally had to say, like, I, there was, like, a few of us in a dark hallway, <laughs> like, a hallway that had no light, and it was dark. So close your eyes. And, <laughs> and right. there was, like, poop and blood all over the floor. Everyone's sliding in it because yeah, I feel no, like as a me. as a doctor, right. mm -hmm. like you don't get that sense. Yeah. You know, when you're in the hospital, you get this person. We present you on a bed, and now they're in arrest, unfortunately. But like, you didn't see the nightmare that yeah, like forty yeah, minutes yeah. ago was yeah. this situation mm -hmm. that we were undertaking. You know, so it's like not quite a hospital service. Yeah, it's it like isn't. this yeah. is like what we were with firefighters on this job. Like we were dealing yeah. with it with the fire guys, well, and like with the hospital stuff. I always heard this like this is something over my career that i've heard with hospital-based uh, ems services was that like it always came out well the, one of the advantages to the hospital is that this can generate revenue for the hospital by bringing mm -hmm. patients here and i always said like well that's kind of weird like so you have like i mean it's good you have an ambulance that you're providing it into a 911 system but like when you're you're almost profiting steering steering yeah. people yeah, to come like steering like now it's a like to me i was just like well that just seems shady you know yeah. like yeah. i mean illegal it's yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah and it's yeah. like ah, mm -hmm. all right yeah. well cool mm -hmm. um i know you know and it just like you said i i think it's refreshing to hear about like how this like becomes an emergency service versus the hospital-based service because yeah. honestly for myself that's the first time that i've i've really kind of heard that um angle before when it comes to the the transfer to the fire department. It's mm -hmm. always been like some hardcore New York City EMS people who are like, yeah, this and that. And yeah, you just you don't know what it was like. Yeah. And I'm like, you know, I, <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was very different, you know, and it, it, was, it wasn't it was necessarily because of the switchover. It's just because of time, you know, like now we have cell phones and we have better yeah. technology. Although our machinery was much smaller back then and now yeah. they're much heavier. And yeah. the life pack that I used to use was much easier to carry. It was later like when it knocked into my leg it, it <laughs> created a bruise, bruise but not <laughs> such a d yeah. well-defined bruise you know <laughs> and uh i don't know everything just seems to be much heavier now what life pack did you start out with uh, i think it was a 12 okay it was, a 12. It was the one right before you the okay one you use now. Nice. Yeah. So yeah. So when you came when you came out bls and mm. we sit on um cross streets where did you sit do you remember where you sat my original one the was original uh so i was moved eventually but um, my original one was uh Second Avenue on 34th Street. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right in Midtown. Midtown, all right. And then eventually um, they changed us all around, and I became uh, 14 Boy, which is the Upper West Side. Okay. But it still came out of Bellevue because... You drove all that way. Yeah, it should have been drive. Yeah, it should have been a metropolitan unit okay. that covered that area, but um, they didn't have the space or something, yeah. so mm. we covered it. So Do you remember how many units came out of eight back then? Um, I'm going to say a lot. It was like about 10. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, it was a decent number because yeah. there were only four stations. Oh, okay. yeah, um, you have a lot. But... I mean, it expanded over time. They used to be like TAC units that used to just cover uh, whatever area the city was lacking. I believe okay. we're starting to do that again, okay. which I think is a good idea. Yeah. yeah. But um, sometimes they were there, and then they moved them <laughs> elsewhere, yeah. and then eliminated. Yeah. And at one time, they started the hazmat stuff. I think I, I think we used to have a hazmat unit over okay. there, but then that also got changed somehow, and I don't I don't really remember. Yeah. About yeah. That. 
And there was a lot mm. more voluntary hospitals back then. Yeah, it was Manhattan still is very much a voluntary hospital okay. area. Um, but yeah, it was very, all of our ALS was basically from the voluntary. Okay. Voluntary. Did you work anywhere else other than Manhattan? Not BOS, no. Not BOS. So then when you went to medic school, you went with the fire department yeah. also? They okay. trained me for everything. You went to, the fire <laughs> you went to HHC's medic program? No, um, we were the fire first <laughs> fire department um, paramedic class. Prior to that, there was no medic classes for okay. like about five years, I want to say. Hmm. They did it periodically, and then hmm. they ran out of funding here and there. And uh, I was like, I'm going to the next one. Okay. The and then there was no next one. <laughs> and then um, when they eventually started it up again, like when the fire department took over, they wanted to – this was a big – thing on there apparently on their yeah. priority list to keep doing this and uh they were only going to take 17 people because they were yeah. going to take people from the prior list okay and and i was one of the 17 yeah. <laughs> so and you had uh, to take a test to get in there yeah how hard was that back then i thought it was pretty difficult and it was also an interview okay and uh, okay and yeah right. you know, I, I was a uh, i love that class that i still have friends from that class what yeah. year did you i don't want to date you oh uh, uh, oh that was 97 97 okay <laughs> all right yeah, so... Um, and did you do it up at Fort Totten? Like yeah, it was at Fort Totten, and okay. uh, we did the same thing that they do now, basically. Okay. Yeah. You know, um, we had a burn center rotation, which apparently just recently got... Yeah, I, yeah, I, I still had the burn center rotation I when I was... I think taken out. They yeah. said, I don't yeah. know why. I thought that yeah, was Yeah, no, that was really good. That was one of the best ones. Yeah. Because yeah. you, know, you get to go to Cornell, and, you mm -hmm. know, we even did pediatric... I don't know if we did it, or they just... A nurse took me there, but yeah. I got to do the pediatric burn center and the adult burn center, like, mm -hmm. which was interesting. Luckily, it was like nothing horrifying, but you know, yeah. like some of the rotations that they they give you, like the, the hospitals took it upon themselves to teach us more. Yes, you know, I, I thought, thought so. it was really good. Yeah, like there was one, uh, I think it was an OBGYN rotation where we were getting nothing. <laughs> you know, I don't think I, I saw a single I baby born yeah. the entire oh, time wow. I was in mine. And they took us over to like the blood lab, and we learned about how they there and that was pretty interesting that's cool and at that time taking bloods on patients was a routine thing and it yeah. was good to know like how much you needed in the tube yeah. and yeah. stuff like that huh. yeah we only <laughs> draw bloods now for um if we have somebody with co poisoning before yeah. Yeah. hydroxybalamin i so think uh, when i got to do my rotations like one of the cool ones which i don't know if they go there anymore was kingsburg jewish mm -hmm. and i guess because at the time like the fire department had like a good rapport with them and um, when the ER was, like, slow, one of the doctors in the front would take us to Fast Track and let us, like, do the interviews with the patients. Oh, wow. Yeah, like, he, That's like, cool. I yeah. thought it was very interesting, you know. Mm -hmm. I was like, I have my lab coat. I look <laughs> like I'm a doctor. <laughs> I know. I'm not even a paramedic, you know. <laughs> but probably filling in for somebody who can work that day. Yeah. <laughs> like, we have no PAs today, so no. uh, you're up. So, you, so how long was medic school back then? It was the same. It was about nine months. Nine months. Yeah, okay. Months. And then do you remember what unit you precepted on? Um, yeah, we, I, uh, I, I, it was at a metropolitan. I remember picking it, and uh, okay. I had seniority, so I got to, uh, I got it over. Like <coughs> a lot of people fought for it, and they okay. were a lot of fun. Um, I think they work in Connecticut now, the two of them. Okay, yeah. and that was they were a, a really good pair that had been together for okay. a very long time. And I believe they're still somewhat together wherever it is that they work yeah. now. Oh, you know, that's nice. which is a lot of fun. Um, yeah. and they were really good. Um, but and that I was your first unit out of the academy. No, that was my intern unit. Your intern and unit. then okay. um, when, when you came out, you just threw you on a truck. You didn't okay. have the intern period like right. you have now. Yeah. You know, you, you pr uh, I mean, you did, but I mean, you didn't work with your partner, but it wasn't a specific internship unit. You just got, um, I whatever number of hours. Was it a mix? Yeah. yeah. And if you finished that in two months, <laughs> yay. That, that's <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> you know, you could basically, but yeah. I didn't. So you went up to Metropolitan then first as ALS? Like no, as ALS, I went to um, Brooklyn. Okay. I, I went to uh, 39. Oh, 39 on... Was 39? It was on Pennsylvania. It was still on Pennsylvania. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. and um, that was fun. And then when 44 opened, our unit was going to go to 44. And then we became 44. Still on Rockaway? Yeah. Rockaway Avenue? Oh. It was there when it opened. Oh, nice. <laughs> and that was fun. Um, that was a really great place to work. Where I met my spouse, <laughs> 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 and uh, it was a lot of fun. Uh, we had great supervisors that like uh, try to emulate, <laughs> yeah. and um, it was a really nice um, station for a long time. Okay. The people there were great, and uh, 
I have nothing but good memories. It was a hellhole to work in. Oh, yeah. You sure. know, there's Busy nothing to eat. Yeah. What's the, what's like you say there's nothing to eat and it's a hellhole oh, to work in. Like, there's there's no yeah. stores. There's okay. no restaurants. There's no fast food even after 6 p.m. basically. And, and where is this? Uh, it was East New York. Oh, East New York. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I've, I've heard and, uh, stories. You'd have to really travel to. Yeah. And it was just all, like, it was very violent. Like, the crime rate was, like, through yep. the roof back then. And uh, What year was this now? It was the um, the early two thousands, um, and uh, I think the seven five was still going the rate of the busiest precincts, yeah. mm. and uh, it was crazy, you know. But it was good for us, you know, because yeah. we like trauma and yeah. everything like that. Like there was no shortage of shootings. When I went to Manhattan, I never had a gunshot wound, not yeah. once. And then <laughs> you go to Brooklyn, and it's like, oh, it's no big deal, you know. You remember how many you were doing a day back then? Um, shootings, like I want to say about two a week. Roughly, okay. you know, um, but like it was all spread out. It was mostly a BLS call type. You yeah, know, so that's the one know. thing with us that nobody knows that shootings and stabbings are all BLS. Yeah. Everywhere else, you get the medics. You know. Yeah. yeah. So you know. But really, BLS, you're gonna BLS these jobs. I mean, mo- mm-hmm. most of it. Like Unless we're coming. <laughs> well, we yeah. come and steal them, but like otherwise, <laughs> um, for you, for and we will shot. start a line. But like we're doing BLS. Yeah, I mean, I that's what you need for yeah, those exactly. calls. Yeah, you know, yeah. they don't. They need an operating room. They don't need. Yeah, you don't need me. They don't need yeah. a bunch of yeah. silliness. That yeah. we're, you know. Yeah. Uh, I think we were um, up in up in the Hudson Valley. We've been doing the rescue task force stuff, and it was just it's so much fun to watch people freak out and like, all right, hey, we're going to do rescue task force stuff, and they're like. That's really the job of the paramedic, and the yeah. others and that. I'm like, <laughs> no, like it's like they, they don't like. I, I bet you, if we ask the paramedics, they're gonna do the same stuff we're doing first before they even think about any of the ALS care. So like, just do it, and yeah. it's uh, it's. I, I think yeah. everybody forgets that that BLS and diesel really saves lives. Yeah, yeah. 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 So BLS it's not before paramedics. ALS, yeah. And I think because the so. BLS are just so young and new, they don't really realize how much they can do on so their own. Yeah. So going on that, you say young and new. When you came on. What were the oh people have yeah, the loads people of like experience that. you know so like it took me a that, long time you know, to go to medical school mostly because I was waiting for the class okay mm-hmm. but um you know people did have a decent amount of time on the job but I mean people still were leaving like they do now yeah you know um but it wasn't all in one big group okay. <laughs> yeah. whereas now they take three hundred at a clip and you know we're devastated by wow. that whereas yeah. before um it used to just be like two or three going to PD and PD was the big draw okay. back then most people went to PD yep. and um. You know, or they went to various schools like health and hospitals. One of the good things about them is that they s- they let you become a nurse. Okay. Or, or um, they had um, respiratory therapy as well, um, and you could do that through them for free. Like you'd go full time. And, yeah. Um, but you know that doesn't happen anymore. No. no. Yeah. no. <laughs> well, they probably were like losing people. Yeah. yeah. And, <laughs> you know? and we, you'd be losing them to something that you don't have. Yeah. You know, whereas now you're losing them because they're on fire. Yep. You know, yeah. They're still in house. Mis- what was some of the stuff that the older people told you back then, for as far as like the experience? Yeah, you know, I like mean, when you say like, people were experienced back then compared to now, like I mean, they were comfortable with things. You know, okay. they were comfortable handling a lot of things on their own, like uh, violent patients. Yeah. You know, it was almost unheard of to ask for help for that. Okay. Which I think one of the good things about the BLS asking for ALS on gunshot wounds is that now you have more people you yep. know, to deal with the crowds and stuff like that. Because yeah. the crowds are. Sometimes, yeah. you know, yeah. <laughs> you don't know who the bad guy is and sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. I think that for a lot of people, too, uh, if you've never had um, a crowd turn on you. Yes. Or <laughs> and, 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 like mm-hmm. it, and it's hard to describe because you're talking to providers out there who've never experienced a, you know, an, a, an act of violence in um, a poor community. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden there's this palatable shift in the energy. Yeah. I don't even think it has to be like that type of community. It could be anywhere. Oh, yeah. 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 It could be anywhere. When yeah, I worked in like Pennsylvania, mm-hmm. I was more nervous, you know, something happened out there because the cops aren't coming mm-hmm. and everybody can shoot. Yeah. yeah. You know? Yeah. So you just, a lot of people like to stay on outside. You need to get inside, you know. Yeah, you're yeah. going you to strange get, people's get homes. Truck, yeah. You know, get yeah. back in your truck as quick as you can. Exactly. So. Yeah. And that's like, and, and just kind of hearing that, like, as far as like, you know, what you used to handle yeah. on your own without. Yourself any assistance yeah, to I now know. is kind of... Yeah. And you go into these strange homes, you know? Like, it could be so a rich person. They could be crazy. You know? Yeah, yeah like they you could never have know what you know. you're walking into. <laughs> exactly. You know, and they, um, some of the homes, you know, where you go to, like, they're, they're, it's, it's not even the patient, but their relatives and, you know, That's the neighbors, you, yep. you know, and they've all got something to say. And I, I, I think it's probably worse now because I think social media gives you a voice that you didn't have before. Yes. And it, people become more likely to say things that they would have kept to themselves, and they're more likely to question things. And 
you know, you should see some of the complaint letters that, you know, mm-hmm. you get sometimes and people call, people come to our station and, and knock on the door to complain about something that happened three months earlier. And, and they're just as fired up as the day it happened, <laughs> you yeah. know, about, you know, uh, I left my, uh, my, my phone in the vehicle and they took it and, you know, <laughs> you just notice it's missing now. <laughs> yeah. No. I don't know. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's just, you know, I think that people are more assertive, which sometimes is good and sometimes is bad. <laughs> it's bad for us. Yeah. yeah. It can be. You know, because a lot of people don't know what we're supposed to do, and they think you're just supposed to pick them up and drive them to the ambulance and drive away, and they don't really realize it. Like, when people complain about the cost of the ambulance, they just think it's the, it should be the equivalent of a taxi cab fare. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, when they find out that the bill is, like, yeah. $1,300, it's like, well, what is that for? And, and, like, there's salary involved and that equipment. Yeah. And most of the monitors list yeah, them, like, $40,000, you know. So, like you know, depending on the call type, we're actually doing what they would do in a triage yeah. in <laughs> the emergency room, you know. Nobody yeah. realizes that it's, like, $3,000. Mm-hmm. Call for an unconscious for an engine company and an ambulance to show up. It's, yeah. it's like, $3,000. Do you think, because yeah. that's one thing I think that um, there's a lot of stuff going on up in up in, in uh, the Hudson Valley about like a shortage of units and stuff and people are like, oh, they're calling ambulance for these BS reasons. And I say like, but do we ever, have we ever educated the consumer, the, mm-hmm. the 911 caller of what to do, like wha- I mean, what what's the appropriate phone call to make? Like when are, what is a ma- um, an emergency? I don't know. Or that we even the services that we provide. Out. I saw something on YouTube the other day that I thought was interesting. It was like a PSA from Indonesia. And I guess they're like, wow. it's <laughs> not, n- I think it's like 995 is the equivalent of, you know, our 911 or 999 in the UK or whatever. Um, and it was basically a song about how, like, you know, what to call. And I'm like, I'm just getting warm. You guys are getting hot. <laughs> no, like, it's freezing. Like cold. I know. <laughs> but, um, no, shaking here. Yeah, it's like, cold. it was cold in we here. We paid the bill. <laughs> um, but, uh-huh. yeah, it was an interesting little sing-song commercial, but it's essentially telling people, like, um, you know, no, 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 don't call for this silly nonsense. You know, like, if you have toe pain, like, take yourself to urgent yeah. care. And mm-hmm. there's actually another number that you can call. I don't know what, if it's, like, cost-effective for people. Maybe you do have to pay, essentially, for a cab. Yeah. Um, but I feel like we don't really do that here, I think. Yeah. I think they're looking at that in D.C. It, I, think, I think in this, in, in New York City where we work, it's also, like, um... You know, you don't want to run the risk of like having someone sue, or yeah. you know, like there's a lot that goes into it. That, that always struck me as like they they all throughout my career, I've been running from a lawsuit. Yeah, yeah. I've yeah. never uh-huh. been sued. Yeah. Not I know. But like RMAs, like I was always told, like as an EMT, like make sure you document this RMA mm-hmm. because if it's not like this, this is the most like this this one will take you down. <laughs> and then yeah. I get to like a car accident, and I have like five cars that have rear-ended each other. Yeah. Like seventeen people have called nine one one. It's now like coming <laughs> as like you know, yeah, like entrapment and like you <laughs> yeah. know, death and, and I get there and it's, it's BS. But now I've got to do like each car's got two people. Yeah. I got twelve yeah. PCRs that I have to. Ar- and like, I said, did anybody here call for an ambulance? And they're all yeah. like, no. Yeah, it's just property <laughs> damage. And it's like, um, but yeah, no. it's, I've always been. I know. I don't know if if any of those actually come back to bite anyone. Yeah, I know. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like there are like some. Obviously, it's like, okay, well, this is obviously a patient. You just don't want our help, 93. And then, like, we had one that was, like, a wrong door recently. Oh, yeah. We went all the way up to the ninth floor. We rang the bell, and it was, like, this older woman was, like, I didn't call 911. And we're, like, okay. So we go back downstairs. We get on the radio. No, it's not the right apartment. Can we have an apartment? They do a call back. They're, like, nope, that's the apartment. We're, like, well, there's only this older lady. And they were, like, well, write an an RMA. RMA. I'm, like, this is not the correct address. Like, I'm writing an (laughs) RMA for some old lady who didn't call 911. Like, that's not... Yeah, yes. thank God we don't bill for that. Yeah, you know. there's a lot of places that are billing for that now. And, and the libertarian crazy. side of me is just like, I don't want the government having my information. Yeah, like, yeah, and I'm not exactly. going to go ring this ba- lady who didn't call 911, mm-hmm. who was in her pajamas. I don't yeah. want to ring her bell again. Mm-hmm. Like that's yeah. you know to disturb her a second time for so, nothing. So now we we're required to get a lot more paperwork. How was it back then when you were um, HHC? If you had like a 90, you know, a 96, which is a no patient. Like how was it back then? Could you come back and we had a log um, that we wrote things on. Um, I, th- I mean, they still yeah. wanted you to do paperwork on all of these. Uh, the one thing about the RMA back then is if you were over 60, you had to RMA. Oh, yeah. Which is okay. really, I'm glad they got rid of that. That's yes. really insulting. You it know, was. that you're over 60, you can't make a decision without talking to a doctor. Yeah. You know, and wow. uh, yeah, it was really ridiculous. And, um, and people are angry. Yeah, and, and rightfully so. And 
I think there was a while there that there were more people suing about you forcibly going to the hospital than uh. you know, you know, you didn't take yeah. me. Yeah. <laughs> but and and also that you know, like I think there was a decent amount of kidnapping, and there was a while where social <laughs> services <laughs> encouraged it because there were, I remember going to at least three or four jobs where um, we were called by people who were evicting people. And, you know, they wanted us to take them to the hospital, get them out of the way okay. so that they could oh kick them gosh. out of their yep. homes. Yeah. And, and it was really shady. And uh, um, um, my partner, the one that did the intercom thing at one point, I remember he came to work in a suit and tie. And I was like, you know, today's your day off. What are you doing here? And he's like, oh, I'm going for Miss, R- Miss Abramowitz, you know, or whatever. And I'm like, what happened? And he's like, you know, she, she got kicked out of her apartment. I'm going to testify that she shouldn't have been kicked out of her apartment, you know. Wow. And uh, he was really active in a lot of things, you know, like that. And... Uh, you know, he uh, he would call the family up, and you know, because rents uh, the rent control departments, uh, those were big ones for kicking yeah. people out. And they, I, I don't know what the criteria was, but a lot of the elderly, if you went to the hospital enough times, okay. you were out. You know, so the landlords would, you know, because you'd get the anonymous phone call about the crazy woman in apartment, whatever, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, there would be nothing wrong with them, yeah. and. Um, we felt obligated to take them because somebody called, and the, and usually the elderly don't put up that much of a fight. At least back then they didn't, and it was really little mean, you know. And whoever did these things, and my partner was like, "Nope, we're not doing it," you know. And uh, he used to call the Department of the Aged on it, and mm. he went to the City Council on it, and you know he did a lot of things as far as the elderly, <laughs> you know, because I didn't notice it because I was young and naive, but yeah. he. he like this is ridiculous you know yeah. this is obviously somebody wants this woman out of the apartment and you know or a neighbor would kill 911 because they wanted their friend to get that apartment and oh. there were a lot of you awful things going now? on no, as not as a a lieutenant? no no not at all okay not at all. what you know what are like so i mean i'm where i work i'm a lieutenant um but like what is what is it like being a lieutenant for ems in the city because i think it's got to be a very interesting aspect of the job in, in that supervisory role I, I've heard, you know, like some people say, like, oh, it's like a, having like a, you know, a friend on, on home base for you, like to kind of help protect the crews. Hopefully, like, yeah. I mean, what, what is it like for you and like your own words? You um, know? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It, it, it's, it's pretty cool sometimes, you know, and sometimes it's, you know, like, what did you call me for? You know, and I noticed that a lot of like the BLS are afraid to make a lot of decisions about like armies or um, a lot of times you get called because the patient wants to go to a particular hospital that, you know, the crew thinks is too far away for them. But uh, the way I was taught was always that you take people where they want to go. Um, I was told that by the second in command at one of my refreshers that that's we're a service-based industry and you take them where they want to go. If, if they want to go there, you just follow the procedure. And I think a lot of people just, you know, are just like, oh, you don't want to go there, you know, and then they go to the closer hospital. And the only way that that would be corrected is if everybody went to their tri- hospital of choice and all the units would crisscross across the city and then probably they'd be like, no, you have to go to Post 911. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but um, we uh, when I worked in Brooklyn, I loved taking people to Manhattan. That's yeah, yeah, you know? me too. <laughs> yeah, it's like an adventure, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like a vacation yeah. for a little like bit. How far can we? I get? know there was one uh, crew at our station that fi- did the five row yes. tour, yes. and yeah. I gave them a certificate of uh, yeah. excellence. Yeah. I felt like that was my yeah. job as a lieutenant, so yeah. I reward that kind of behavior. We've but been <laughs> trying for that ever since. Yeah, it's really <laughs> hard to do. That certificate, you know, it was very exciting to and see. I mean, it's a little easier now that you got a twelve hour tour. But those guys did it in eight. I know. <laughs> wow. Was, that was yeah. very yeah. impressive. Yeah, they started in Staten, they started Island. In Staten Island and yeah. they ended I up, I think, in I don't Bronx. Know <laughs> but I, I feel like we've been to at least three boroughs in one day. Yeah. yeah, we've never gotten to Staten Island, mm-hmm. but we we definitely do Queens, Manhattan, and Brooklyn in a tour easily. Mm-hmm. And even Long Island we've done. Yeah. But um, I saw a crew up at Westchester Medical Center. Oh. Somebody <laughs> sent me a picture of that. They were like, they had somebody in the Bronx yes. so like right on the border. And they're like, I want to go to Westchester Medical Center. And like, like, I'm sure. Let me call the <laughs> boss real quick. If it's early yeah. in my day, I'll take care of everyone. I feel like I for know. us, like if it's 5 p.m., 6 p.m., and it's rush hour, it's a little harder. Mm-hmm. We try to tell the family, like, look – not that we don't want to do it, but if it takes us an hour and your and your loved one is actually like very sick, we really can't do that. You know, it would be like yeah. detrimental to the patient. But like once we hit like eight o'clock, I'll go anywhere that you want to go because yeah, it's sort of like we're not going to hit any traffic, yep. and mm-hmm. we can pretty much get to anywhere in like twenty minutes for yeah. the most part. You know, at like one a.m., like yeah. that's it. You're you're the city is your oyster. Yeah, you, you know. Like what's the furthest hospital you've been to from uh? From oh, there was something Long Island. I, um, I think I went to. St. Francis uh, mm-hmm. once. Um, it was the last day of work when one of my favorite partners, you know, oh quit yeah. the next day, basically. Okay. <laughs> she was in my med class. And 
And that was a fireman, and that was in Greenpoint. They were in Greenpoint, mm -hmm. and they wanted to go there. And it was a, it was actually a big deal okay. um, because the fire department said no. Really? And then their kids called up, <laughs> and eventually <laughs> it changed that you can go there. Yeah. You know, but did they do the relocation thing? <coughs> so, like, when we come out of a hospital now, oh, no, we're no. available <laughs> in that area. No, there's nothing like that. Oh, so you, like, yeah. you run back. Yeah, and you can you're well, um, in Long Island, you're just not on the map anymore. Yeah, I noticed that. <laughs> you go ahead and, and then, yeah, and then all of a sudden you cross the border and now, yeah. <laughs> you know. <clears throat> but um, yeah, basically you just went back and if you got a job in that area, yeah, you, know, you had to use your paper map, <laughs> yeah, <Remember that? laughs> and discover yeah. how to get there. Yeah, we found that out a lot. Um, we've had people that are driving us and they can't. <clears throat> we're around the corner. Yeah, and it's our first do, and they don't know how to get to Woodhall. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's like it's that big hospital <laughs> over there. I'm like, just look and up. We're, we're circling the block. <laughs> I know. You know, and I have to peek through and give my words of encouragement. I think no. now that we don't <laughs> have, that's, you know, that's the culture that's like the younger generation, like that we always had a street atlas in mm -hmm. our vehicles, you know, and you had to look at it and know how, which way you were going. And if you didn't know where you were, like I remember when I was working in Poughkeepsie. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Like I forget, there was a, a medic I used to work with sometimes. She was scary. She was, she was military, I forget her name. Irene? Irene, yes. Yeah, Irene, right, right, yeah. And um, she was like, she reminded me of Ann Sale. She was like oh, very yeah. like, we need to do this, you know? And like, <laughs> we were going to some some place for a call, and it was a 911 call, and she gave me like the atlas, and I'm like, I did not, I was not raised in Poughkeepsie, so I'm like, everything's upside down. She's like, what are you doing? Look at the map. I'm like, and I was like getting so anxious, but I'm like, I don't know. And she's like, oh, she like pulled over. She's like, this is where we are. I'm like, okay, oh, okay. <laughs> and then I was like able to figure it out, and I was and, like, and yeah. Irene, yeah, like, uh, unfortunately, she passed away from cancer a couple of years ago, but um, she had like two speeds stopped and passed. <laughs> so like, <laughs> she would, uh, she might have pointed out like, this is where we are. Mm -hmm. That's where you were like five minutes ago. She was <laughs> driving the bus at like a hundred miles an hour yeah. uh -huh. uh, to get to the to get to the call. I remember when I um, we used Jamapco books and uh, you know up in the Hudson Valley we covered four four different counties. So uh -huh. like she came out to the bus before map books. I'm like Irene, what are you doing? She's like, if I have to give directions, I just open them up and I make the map. And she's yeah. like, and she, she would put because like you'd have mm -hmm. a, a sixty minute response time, mm -hmm. and so she'd you have to cross over pages. Yeah, yeah. And I she's used like to get a big big map. It looked like uh -huh. the the cover of you know the screen the, the fields that yeah. you used yeah. to get the keep the sun out of you. Oh right? my gosh! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was you get a so. map like that. <laughs> <laughs> oh. but, but I mean, <laughs> it's but you did also seeing that. I think it made it more real, like where you are and, and you know, where you're going. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> Whereas now everybody plugs something into their GPS or uses the GPS that we have on the KDT, yep. mm -hmm. which doesn't always work that well. It doesn't yeah. tell you um, when the streets are closed and, and yeah, exactly. street fairs and the like school it had me going through like the Brooklyn Navy Yard one night. <laughs> I'm like, there's a gate there. I know. Like, yeah, yeah. You know, that's I can't go through that now. I think uh, like working in Putnam County, I remember the first time I, I went down to Phillipstown and Medic One, and, and they I said, "What do you have to tell me about this place?" And they're like, "If it says Brook, there's a brook." <laughs> if it says mountain pass, you're going over a mountain. Uh -huh. like, and it's like literally the words, like the street names are going to tell you what the, the terrain is. And I was mm. like, all right. And I, I've always said Putnam County was drawn by like kids with crayons. Uh -huh. yeah. so they figured out the roads. Like, wow. But yeah. Oh, wow. So. I know. What, um, like for the, so far in the career, like, what are some of the memori uh, like, uh, memorable events that you've come across, like whether it be calls or just like, you know, um, professional accomplishments? Like, is there anything that sticks out in your mind that you're like, this was pretty cool or mm -hmm. it was like, you know, it, it maybe changed you in a positive way, like, uh, you know, and, and it kind of pushed you even to be b that much better at your job? Um, I'm just trying to think. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I feel like there's the lot of, a lot of the good things that you do, you tend to not, you know, because you do, so many nice things for people that eventually like they kind of all meld into one <laughs> big yeah. job yeah and um i, I you know uh, it's kind of discouraging because they change the protocols all the time and um like you know i remember saving a lot of people with lasix and now everybody's like oh, you were killing people when you were giving lasix yeah. and they're gonna say the same thing about amiodarone in the future yeah. and yeah. It'll come back it'll come back <laughs> in the yeah again. like we're getting fertilium again yeah. <laughs> and mm -hmm. um you know, just there's so many little things that you just kind of gloss over because they weren't such big magical moments, you know, and you kind of remember all the bad, terrible things or the funny things, you know. But um, 
Yeah, and like defining moments, I don't know of that many that are positive. You know, that, I mean, they're all a lot of good things that happened, and like like my partner with me, she's a bomb with stuff like that. Yeah, you know, and uh, um, I just you know you tend to always focus on like the bigger things that like nine eleven wasn't all that great, <laughs> you right, know, but that yeah. stands forward in your memory, you know, and stuff like that. And there's kids that we work with now. That were still in like yeah they were in grammar sixth school grade, or something fifth yeah grade, you know like my kids they don't, she's like what's the twin towers I know like I remember so. the first nine eleven <laughs> you know yeah. when they just yeah. blew up the place and were it you least. working that day or no oh thank you <gasps> uh. <laughs> did you get a note I watched from television though it, it, it didn't work you know your uh. television didn't work if the tower was out <laughs> yeah. yeah and um, I found out about it like eight hours later but I guess I'm go over time for it after that yeah. you know okay. but you know <laughs> should have been there yeah. <laughs> But, you know, um... What are others some memorable? Because I know you, you keep a scrapbook, right? Yeah, yeah. I have some uh, interesting little articles. I know you got a good one, too. Oh. <laughs> I could tell you one of the worst things that ever happened that I didn't think was the worst. Um, and it was, uh... It was, uh, this is a big... This is kind of a long story here. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. Yeah, um, I know that we had a, a third paramedic on the truck who was... He was uh, coming back from something. Like he was a paramedic. He wasn't a student, and he just was required to ride with us. Yep. And it was wonderful that he was on that truck that day. And um, I remember it being a late job, and I was with one of my really good partners, and uh, they came, you know, some BLS was crying over the radio, and, you know, like you notice those things, and I was like, please don't let it be us, please, yeah. because we wanted uh -huh. to go home. Yeah. You know, and then it was something Victor got called, and I was like, please be fine. Uh, nope, it was three seven Victor, and uh, so we went to it. And it w when when the job came over the KDT, it was really awful just to read it. It said that the twin had been delivered um, a week earlier, and now the second twin was being delivered, and it was like twenty two weeks or something yeah. like that. It, it sounded like a really complicated OB job, which I don't know if you know, but like most paramedics don't enjoy the uh, <laughs> yeah. the OB. <laughs> Do you know how many kids you delivered? Um, it wasn't that very much. It, it was maybe. What about they were not good deliveries either. Oh, like, it yeah, was like six or seven. Any. And, mm -hmm. you know, like, you go to the, you know, you tell people that, and then, like, they were all taken by social services, you know, ev almost every single yeah. one. Like, I don't think I've ever delivered a normal, yeah. you know, happy delivery where it's like, yeah, <laughs> you yeah, know. You have to catch one. Yeah, they were all terrible. And, uh, and this one was actually not that terrible at the okay. outset um, because, I mean, the family was really nice. You know, they were like a typical middle class family. Like, they had a beautiful house. They had a little, they had a son. And the son was excited about the birth of this baby brother or sister. Yeah. And, um, you know, you could see artwork on the fridge from the kid. And, you know, it was just a nice house. They were nice people. They yep. seemed to be very well educated. It was just the, the person that was pregnant and her mother who was there to watch the child. And uh, apparently she had um, some sort of complication where one twin was delivered earlier by 5-7 Victor, oh, wow. and um, that child didn't make it, and now she felt that this was happening, you know, she, she knew that the next one was coming. So the crew had already delivered the baby by the time we'd gotten there, and it was like 22 weeks or something. It was very, very small. Yeah. And uh, it was a girl, and um, it, it was just, it, none of your equipment fits you know, yeah. like you can't yeah. tube the baby. The yeah. face mask doesn't fit. It was just very small. It, it, it you know, it, it's a, r it's a very big challenge. So the paramedics that was extra, he drove with the mother and the BLS, and my partner and I were left with the baby, mm -hmm. and that was kind of a harrowing job. We didn't really know what to do, <laughs> you know, because yeah. nothing fit. You know, you yeah. couldn't tube the kid, but the kid was fighting. The kid was breathing. The kid was like wanted to scream if it could, yeah. you know, and it, she was moving. So we kept her warm, and uh, we did the best we could, and we went to the hospital, and uh, the hospital was very impressed with uh, how well the baby was doing. And yeah. they, they, you know, told the family that, you know, this crew, you know, it helped your baby, you know, saved your baby, and we were, like, very proud of that, yeah. you know. We were, like, because the other baby didn't make it, and this yeah. one made yeah. it, and um, we went to go visit the baby uh, maybe two days later, and oh. she was doing really well, they were saying, and uh, we met the father, who was also, some, you know, kind of nice to us, yeah. and uh, the woman was really nice as well, you know. I just have nothing but good memories of that family. Yeah. And, um, but the kid was 22 weeks, and, uh, you know, we a few weeks later, maybe months later, I remember seeing on the wall at the hospital they, they usually keep letters of uh, people who write to the hospital saying yeah. thank you for treating grandma and stuff like that. Yeah. 
and I recognized the name, and it was the uh, the mother, and she wrote, "Thank you for all you did, and uh, you did the best you could with what you had, mm-hmm. and we appreciate what you did." Blah blah blah. So, I didn't know that the kid, you know, d- maybe she was talking about the first one, you yeah. know. And so a few years later, my partner pointed out to me in the newspaper because there was still newspapers. Yeah. It's like, that's the kid right there. And there was an article in the paper about this family that had basically killed their child um, oh neglect. And it was the baby we delivered. And uh, if you read the article, you'd never know that they were a nice middle-class family. family that we met. Because they totally changed. Like, I believe that this child was just more than they could handle. Yeah. And they turned to, like, crime, basically. Like, they were selling drugs out of their apartment. Like, they showed you oh a wow. picture of the apartment. The apartment was destroyed. Wow. It wasn't the same beautiful home with the artwork from the children and mm. you know like the, the other child had been taken away yeah. and and this like they'll tell you that the when the baby died she was only 64 pounds but like that child was never going to be a full-size yeah. child you know mm. and they just couldn't handle it you know they didn't they just gave a benadryl constantly because they, they didn't know you know they just wanted to keep her sedated yeah. and eventually it was too much and that was like like we, we were like so proud of ourselves yeah. for delivering that baby, yeah. and then to see four years later that she died anyway of like really terrible circumstances, yeah. you know, like that that sticks with you a little, you know, yeah. that's pretty horrible. But you know, and and it wasn't just tragic about the child, you know, like the whole family, the family yeah. you know, went down. took a, yep. a turn. You know, yeah. the the grandmother and the the daughter went to jail, <laughs> and the, the father left and disappeared. And <laughs> you oh know, God. and uh, <laughs> it's just awful all the way around. And that's that's sadly the stuff that sticks with you, right? As yeah. opposed to like all the great times when you know you helped out so and so, and you know, and that's uh, thankfully people write letters, you know, um, th- not that often, but you know, sometimes people will be like, you know, so and so helped me with this, and and then you're like, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we did something nice. And I yeah. think just being nice to people in general, you know, is is half of the job. Yeah. 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 You know. That's the one thing. It's like if you're not nice to somebody, they're gonna remember you. Yeah. And then you go in the bodega to get a Pepsi, and they're gonna mm-hmm. remember you. Yeah. It's not hard to find us. I know. Oh, yeah. You know. You could save somebody's life, but you take them to a hospital they don't want to go to. No, that's the truth. <laughs> yeah. Honestly, I feel like even you know, my mom passed away a couple years ago, and she passed away in a hospital, and like it was not the way that we all would have loved for it to have gone down, but like. I wrote a letter to the hospital because I was so genuinely impressed by the care that they took of not only my mom, but of us, like her family. Mm. Um, Like, you know, that was like such a horrible time in my life and like the life of my family. But like, I, I mean, I, I can honestly say like, I really, that hospital has like a special place in my heart because I, you know, they did such an amazing job. I thought to help my family through this like terrible time so, you know, I think, like, how we treat people, like, really yeah. makes a difference. Oh, d- you know? definitely. It makes yeah. a world of difference, you know? Yeah. And there's mm-hmm. no reason to be a creep to mm-hmm. someone, you know? Like, it's yeah. like you're, you're it's one snippet in someone's life, mm-hmm. and you're a part of it, you know? It's, mm-hmm. I don't know, they're going to remember how you treated them that day. So, you know? so you came out, you were at 3-7. At mm-hmm. You were on 3-7, Victor. Yeah. For how many or years? 3-9. Like, eight, well, it was... um. I think it was 3-7 Victor out of 39, I believe. Okay. Yeah, it stayed over. So I think I was on that truck for, well, it was also 4-4 Victor for a little while. Okay. and um, But mostly 3-7 Victor, and that was like eight years, I'm going to okay. say, with the same partner. That's awesome. Oh, wow. You know, and um, I had th- the other partner, you know, there's you have three. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's three on a truck, so uh, one partner is the constant, and then the other partners were also good, but yeah. for shorter periods of yeah. time. That's, yeah, that's what I used to yeah. do when I was with the guys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. The wild yeah. card. Yeah, yeah, you always have a wild card. You have like one part that you really like working with, mm-hmm. and you're not with them that much. Yeah. Yeah, this just stinks. And then, you know, but I mean, it, I was really, really lucky with the partners I had. Okay. I was incredibly lucky. Like, it's very rare. Like, they're very short periods of time when I had, like, terrible partners. And yeah. I think that shaped my whole positive view of yeah. this job, you know, yeah. as opposed to, like, you know, other people I know that weren't so lucky. <laughs> <laughs> you know. But well, I mean, a... a bad partner can sort of yeah it ruins everything yeah it can ruin <laughs> your day a bit you know so i remember you guys had mask pants back then oh yeah mm-hmm. yeah can you know. tell us a little bit what they are oh there are these inflatable <laughs> pants it also <laughs> like uh, <laughs> you used a pump it was one of the skull stations um when okay. it could be a less refreshing yeah and uh it was um uh the idea was to shunt the blood from your legs to your uh, heart 
Okay. But, you know, basically if there's holes, we didn't have, like, too many exceptions on the holes in the chest. Yeah, I think, I mean, a penetrating chest injury was one of them, but, like, if it was just a little bit lower, <laughs> you're yeah. still shooting blood out of the hole, you know? It would actually shoot it out? <laughs> I mean, it would more like ooze. Mm. I mean, I, I yeah. don't okay. remember using them too much for what they were intended for. I remember we rescued a dog with one once. Too. Really? really? Um, it wasn't necessarily a dog. There was a dog in the river, and somebody jumped in to save the dog. Okay. And um, my partner, oh, <laughs> okay, you know, we, we inflated them as, a, as an inflatable device. Oh, my gosh. Wow. Which, um, if anybody had found that out. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but we got on the news for that, you yeah. know, saving the dog. <laughs> There's yeah. a picture of me holding this little Aww. fluffy terrier. Okay. You know. Um, you, really, you know, like there's other purposes for your equipment than yeah. <laughs> that is, and that's intended. a lot of people don't realize that you can use all kinds of stuff for, for yeah, exactly. Things. Like yep. I, I was hoping they wouldn't take the longboards off when the whole thing changed, just because that's a, a great carrying device. Yeah, or yeah. well, even stabilization, like in crappy ground, like I like yeah. having backboards just to put down because mm-hmm. now it's a solid basis to try yeah. to stand on. And you get stuck and in the mud. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, just yeah. Like, like the KED, I, I've always like the yeah. original. You know, Rick Hendricks originally designed it to come out of these scoop seats and uh and in race cars um out of the frame of the roof. But like, mm-hmm. it's a great tool for fire departments that aren't quite ready for low angle um rescue. And it, like you can package somebody in that, mm-hmm. and there's a little loop on it because yeah, originally you can designed carry them. for a tow truck to come up on the NASCAR circuit mm-hmm. and. You'll wow. people out, so like it's a your KEDs are are great extrication tools if you need to bring somebody up a shaft. Or mm-hmm. I mean, I'm sure the tech rescue guys out we there will be like, that. we've got all <laughs> these other fancy things. Like we tie knots, we don't yeah. need. Either. But it's it is something that's hmm. you know a, it's another like I said a tool in the arsenal that yeah. you yeah. kind of use. Got to know what it's it's there for. Yeah. How quick were you guys putting on the mask? And oh, hardly ever. I mean, I, I can't tell you how often I used it. Maybe once or twice. You know, really? Because yeah, yeah. when I was in the academy, they're like, we use this all the time. I don't know. I mean, and they like were covered. Really? <laughs> probably with other, probably <laughs> with other, you know, Never? maybe a different burrows. Oh, I, see. All right. <laughs> I think mass pants really got in like rural settings is where they really yeah. kind of shown through. Yeah, long through. transport time. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it would give you a, a it would give you a pressure, mm-hmm. and you could deliver them to the hospital, and then it was like, please don't take these off. And they're like, <laughs> yeah, I know. all right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 They would just. Yeah, when I first started volunteering, they were like under the seat. Yeah, like, I feel really bad. You get that box, okay? Yeah, I know, yeah. <laughs> exactly. But you know, it served other purposes. It didn't yeah, yeah. Have, and plus, it was another skill station. <laughs> you yeah. know, it was yeah. something to be tested on. I guess. Did you have but wood backboards then? Um, yes, we did, and sandbags, which were disgusting and sticky because, so like, really you re- you reused them, yeah. and there wasn't any really good cleaning facility. What did you use sandbags for? Bags? Stabilize the head. Jeez. I told you. Yeah. I remember talking yeah, about sandbags. No, I'm ancient. I, I told you. you know, and, yeah. and then, you know, the, the sandbags were always sticky from the tape, rough silver tape. And it was just awful. You know? <laughs> it's so much better now that you have something that actually sticks to the board, you yeah. know, and then the collars were, you had to size, you know, them with tape. <laughs> it was just crazy. I can't even tell you, like, how much organization there is now as yeah. compared to back then. Because... I remember we were inspected once by the state, and they discovered, like, I feel like they were looking for something to get us on, and there was so much to get us on, I would think, (laughs) but they got us on, um, like, not having tools, like, not having kind of, like, tools, like a a crowbar crowbar or something like that, and I remember right after that, we got brand new cases with tools, and they were never touched, (laughs) (laughs) you know, as opposed to, like, maybe we could have used more, I don't know. Something else. <laughs> Some actual to equipment. Tires yeah, headbeds. Then, yeah, right? we used to change tires in our white shirts, which oh was the gosh. guy used to show up with a truck yeah. and just give you the tire and the crowbar wow. <laughs> and the tools, you know, that you needed. And then you did it yourself. And I don't even think we were out of service for that. You know, like I've got to think that like once the tire truck showed up, you were like, no, we got to hit that button. You know, or it, was, it was kind of ridiculous. You know, mm-hmm. but I don't know. <laughs> Well, I think earlier they were Peter and was hitting on the fact that like now if like something goes wrong like the truck you get a spare truck yeah you get yeah. a different yeah. truck yeah when we didn't really have like that yeah it was like when if something went wrong they mm-hmm. bought a service truck and then we fixed it yeah <laughs> and we did a terrible job of it which is probably why they stopped it yeah. you know? like, and like the guy standing there next to the truck you know like he's he was making a fortune <laughs> watching yeah. you with your minimum wage job uh-huh. basically yeah. change this tire it was just terrible. Huh. But, you know, then you get filthy dirty (laughs) and you're wearing that white shirt for the rest of the day, you know, and uh, that's one of the other good things that have changed, you know. And you had, what, two-man stretchers back then? Two-man stretchers, which, uh, you know, I I felt kept me strong. Yeah, me too. (laughs) I I kind of liked them. 
because the stretches now they're so heavy you know like the, at least the two mans were somewhat lighter yeah. you know and um i feel like i was much stronger back then you yeah. know <laughs> I don't just miss, carrying I equipment I out when i came out of top class at station 19 and w- there was a two-man stretch and i was like <laughs> I I like this, and I was sending pictures, and we're like, I remember this when I started two man stretches. Uh, you're like literally like, I'm in New dead York City. They still know. Know. <laughs> it but was, it was, and I had two female yeah. partners. Yeah, so it was I like know, three of us, and you I know, doing this. I mean, like exactly, there was no guy stepping mm-hmm. in. We had to do it. I had like a permanent bruise on my thigh. Yeah, from yeah, where yeah. We would, yeah like rest it. legs. Yeah, like, all right, yeah. get it up, rest it, and then put it in. You know, no, and I, I. You know, I think a lot of women don't realize how strong you actually are, yeah. you know, because even just, you know, every once in a while I'll try to do it. And I'm like, oh, I can still do it. And I haven't worked down in 100 years, you know. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I mean, it, I, I felt like going up and down the stairs was a workout. Yeah. And, you know, I still do. I still take the stairs because I'm afraid yeah. of getting stuck in the elevators, you know. And, but <laughs> there's uh, I get your steps in. I know. <laughs> you call it step. Yes, I have my Fitbit. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but, um, yeah, there's a lot of stuff like that. But you know uh, your monitors are heavier. You carry more stuff now. Yeah. yeah. Even yeah. even the stair chair, like we have the strikers now f- with the track on the back of them, mm-hmm. which was great. But like lugging the stupid stair chair and it's, yeah, it's heavier. Heavy. The thing's like fifty. Much seconds. heavier. I mean, I remember like I thought the innovation that was like really awesome was when like the Fernos had like the uh, handles that came out. I was like, this oh makes wow. it so much easier. Because <laughs> <versus laughs> like mm-hmm. for a while, I mean, and, and, and like mm-hmm. said, I, I it's. I don't want to say I regret working for Alamo EMS in Poughkeepsie because it was great to have an experience where you could like have just garbage thrown at you and be like, this is your truck today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, please please tell your driver to warn you when there's bumps because this uh, bench seat has no cushioning left and yeah. it's just a board. And, like, wow. You know. Uh-huh. You know it's, some of the vehicles you used to drive would just, like you could like backfire them and... <laughs> You know, and that was fun too. Oh, <laughs> you know? Know. Oh, but the, uh, the carburetor uh, then, right? Yeah, we had gasoline vehicles for a really short period of time. Okay, and then I don't know. So <laughs> explain this backfire yeah, thing. Yeah. Oh. There's there's Please. gonna be people who are no. like backfire. What's that? Is that? Oh uh, yeah. I thought this was an EMS podcast. We're talking about fire <laughs> stuff. But like, what's? I mean, you could. Uh, it used to do it on its own randomly, yeah. but you could also get it to backfire if you turned it off while it was running and then turned it back on again. And uh, it just it would sound very distinctly like a gunshot. Where, where did you do this? <laughs> that was also Manhattan. You did this in Manhattan. That was Manhattan. Okay. And uh, yeah, you could do it down like a, a busy street if like nobody was getting out of your way. You yeah. know, sometimes sometimes people oh see God. your lights and sirens and they're still crossing the street and they couldn't <laughs> give a damn that you're on your way to something important. You know, and uh, sometimes backfiring comes in handy then. You know, as That's opposed awesome. to like you know. <laughs> we need to rumble or bring the backfire because yeah. the siren's not working. Yeah. So you know maybe. <laughs> but which you know you can't do anymore. No, yeah, because yeah, they're gonna they're gonna call about us. Yeah. Yeah. Well, either way, uh, that, got the diesel diesels, trucks. Yeah, you know. yeah. yeah. more difficult. Yeah, which I don't know if they are built better. You know, because they seem to break. I don't know if yeah. you ask the mechanics, they like them better. Say they would like fix it on the side of the road. Now he's like, oh, oh we're gonna put your truck out of service. Yeah, no, they they very much do that. You know, yeah. but and it's it's lucky we have spares now. Yeah, you know, yeah. Which, you know as much as. Like it's really funny because some of the new people are like, I don't want that truck because it doesn't have a backup camera. <laughs> like backup camera. That was I know. <laughs> yeah. Like yeah. you just had that to have depth thing. perception. Yeah. <laughs> you know before. Yeah. But you could change your own mirrors when the mirrors broke. You know yeah. if you just went to the spare yard and you got one out and <laughs> <laughs> you could fix it without anybody knowing that you just <laughs> you know yeah. you were yeah. hitting. I remember when we g- when we got a backup camera at this moment, I was like, What do you need that for? You can't back up an ambulance and now. I, like, <laughs> I oh know. I love the camera, but uh, I do <laughs> love it. It is really helpful. I know. Soon we'll be backing up into par- parallel park spaces. We'll do it ourselves. Well, I hate. I used to really not like having a parallel park the ambulance because I felt like my depth perception was not ideal. So I was like, I don't know if there's someone back there. <laughs> and like now, I do know if there's someone back there. And that backup camera, I feel like a rock star yeah. when I put yeah. that <laughs> evidence in. I'm like, like the ah, I, I don't know. drive this thing. <laughs> mm-hmm. So now yeah. you're by yourself. You're a lieutenant. What year did you? Oh, I think like 2007. You took a test? Yeah, I, I took several it? tests and I never took it because I didn't want to. I didn't, you know, I was having a great time on the ambulance. It, I guess, right? I deferred Which it a million times. Gosh. I really didn't want to be a boss. Yeah. And um, I really liked what I was doing. I liked my partners. I I mean, going to work wasn't really terrible, yeah. you know, yeah. except the hours. <laughs> you know, the, I mean, the, that you had to actually be physically yeah. there it was terrible. But like, you know, it wasn't, you know, if you have good partners and you're yeah. just having fun all That's day, the you thing, know. Yeah. 
it wasn't really terrible to do, but like becoming a boss to me, like it was like, uh, what am I going to do that for? You know, you became a lieutenant first. Uh, I did. And then, okay. uh, yeah, it was just. So you were um, in charge? I was the original <laughs> lieutenant colonel. <All> right. <laughs> the first. <laughs> and then. And then he became a boss, and then I had to put N in front of my name. <laughs> but, you know, it wasn't... I think your jacket still says... Yeah, I, I mean, if I didn't have it. a couple of um, good role models, I wouldn't have done it at all. Just because, like, when I first started, people were terrible. Like, they, they really didn't like the bosses. It felt like they were beat up as children, and they, <laughs> you know, were using this to, like, have some Assert authority. Yeah. And, and I didn't want to be like that, you know. And um, I was... Um, when I, d- I kept deferring it, um, the only reason I did eventually take it is because my partner that I'd had for eight years went on Lodi and probably wasn't coming back. Yeah. And um, and then I was became a mentor truck because that's when that started. Okay. And my second mentor was just a nightmare. Yeah. And um, and then I was like, is this the way it's going to be? I may as well work by myself. Yeah. <laughs> so then, you know, that's when I took it. And then afterwards, you know, the first two years, I felt like they threw just so much at you, you know, so much responsibility that I didn't think a lieutenant should have to do, like deal what with the hospitals. Yeah, so what does like, a lieutenant do? When you came yeah. out, like, what did you do? Well, they want you to go to the hospital and tell them to speed things up. What and are you telling the, the crews? That it, tell the, well, it, it, the, the idea was if you're not dawdling at the ER, okay. socializing, that the hospital is taking their time. Okay. And they need you out there because we don't have enough units, so you have to be in service more. So rush, 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 get out of the hospital. Yeah. And that means dealing with the nurses. And, I mean, I still feel it's not my job to tell the nurses what to do. I don't, they don't work for me. Yeah. It's not my agency, you know. And so you call the um, administrator on duty, and um, I've never really had a positive experience with them as far as, you know, what they wanted me to do. But, I, you know, one of them once told me that just because, you know, you uh, treat your people like animals. We don't treat ours like Aww. animals. And I was like, I'm not doing that at all anymore. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there's no way that I'll be kicking people out just to shave a minute off. Yeah. You know, if they really, and plus, like the ER time is sometimes your de- decompression time, and I don't think like uh, that's allowed for, and it should be. You know, um, our the firemen on our side get like an hour after a fire, and you know, like you could pronounce a baby or do some horrific yeah. child. Uh, abuse job or some horrific burn and they want you back in service you know yeah. 20 minutes after you got your paper yeah. signed you know and and there's really no allotted time to allow you to do that you know but i think they're becoming more flexible and they're kind of understanding that you know more now but you know we had somebody at our station that killed himself that we all knew very well he was friendly everybody liked him he killed himself they tell you at the station and it's like Get back to work, sign back yeah. on, what are you doing? Like his partners, you know, you would think if, if anybody would be out of service, you'd put them out of service, but no. You know, yeah. we got to run units, we got to run units, and, and that kind of mentality is really, really horrible. And that all comes out of the fact that we never have enough units, we never have enough people, there's yeah. never enough people to take over stuff, you know. It shouldn't be a tragedy to run down a truck every once in a while, yep. you know. Mm-hmm. And we run them down all the time yeah. now because we don't have enough people, but, you know... It, it, it seemed like a more dire emergency to run down a truck ages ago, but it's just the beamer perception, just yeah. because of the way they <laughs> harass you on the phones, which yeah. is something you don't, yeah. you know, yeah. being a lieutenant is, re- I, I don't like talking on the phones, period. Uh-huh. And then that's a big part of my job now. Yeah. And I just, I go back to like, just what you were saying about taking the trucks and taking the crews out of service and how, mm-hmm. like, we really haven't <coughs> started to actually focus on any of those uh, issues of mental health and, and, and mm-hmm. not until the last couple of years, but even then, like I see this resurgence in the fire service mm-hmm. where they're talking about it, but like in EMS. And I, re- I remember my, my most stressful days working in an ambulance was the days where we did serious calls. We dropped mm-hmm. them off at the hospital. I was working for a commercial service. Mm-hmm. So we were doing both 911 and transports. And all of a sudden oh. it's like, Hey, I listen, I really don't care that you just had this, uh, mm-hmm. you know, you SIDS call. Money. Like, yeah. we need you to go up to South Circle 5 and pick up this vent patient mm-hmm. because they've been waiting an hour yeah. and a half. I know. And yeah. you're, like, trying to pay attention to vent settings and all these other things. And what's it, and like, and you're still very yeah. much in, engaged in that. And do you want that ball. kind of person taking care of your, <laughs> right, <yeah. laughs> your child that's an event uh, or whatever, you know? Yeah, and it, it was just, I or know. even me on the road, like, as an EMT, I, I, I'm, I'm still processing this and I'm trying to drive now. Yes. From, mm-hmm. you know, this hospital to this nursing home or mm-hmm. this hospital to another hospital. And, you know, I, like I, I was a few years later where somebody said, yeah, like, t- have you ever driven somewhere and not 
you know, all of a sudden you're there and you're like, how'd I get here? Yeah. Um, like, and that's, that's my home. yeah. I know. Well, <laughs> well, I a lot. Yeah. <laughs> I know. It's, it's really a shame. And it all really, every single thing that, that, terrible i believe about this job all centers around the fact that there's not enough there's not enough units there's not enough people not enough equipment you know there's just not enough stuff we don't have enough vehicles we don't have it's always because of the shortage that you know that's why we kick people out of er before they're ready (laughs) it's why you know um i don't know just every little thing around our job is based on that you know like what do you think would like, I mean, obviously, if we could just pr- start producing more units, that would be great. Yeah. But it's not, <laughs> it literally is not that easy anymore because we're not, rec- I mean, I know statewide we're not recruiting enough mm-hmm. people into the into emergency services to replace what we're losing. Mm-hmm. Or, like you said before, we're losing, you know, uh, people to other, other jobs outside of EMS, other industries. Yeah. Um, so, like, but what are some things that we could do just to kind of, I don't want to say stem the flow, but, like, it's really a giant can of worms. But is there anything, like, yeah. I mean, even if it's just, like you said, like, being nice to people, but... yeah. yeah. I just no, I want to say like Nancy has been my supervisor since I got there in oh. 2008, mm-hmm. and I feel like this is I'm like I wish she could stay for literally ever Aww. for like the yeah. rest Aww, of my thank career. You. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, but uh, oh, I you. mean I feel like when you have good supervisors who yeah. are in there with you, they're not you know sitting behind a desk kind of like they're not part of it. Um, like she and Neil are our immediate yep. supervisors, and like. Neil used to be my partner, and Nancy's always been my supervisor. And, like, I feel like we trust them to know that they they have our best interests yeah. in mind. And, like, I think we are lucky at our station that we have yeah. predominantly good bosses. Mm-hmm. But I feel like I never feel like Nancy looks at me as, like, just get out there and do – like, you know what I mean? She's always, like, looking at yeah. me as a person, a human yeah. being, yeah. like oh, someone you. that we work together. <laughs> like, I think having good bosses is, like, a big part of that mm-hmm. because we all know how it goes, but, like – I think what she does is probably not that easy to do. Like she just yeah. is a great person with Aww. a great personality, Aww. so she brings that <laughs> to work. But like, there's people but there who may not be the best <laughs> boss because they're not the best person. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I, I understand. You know, I know. Like, it's like if you just treat everybody how you know you wanted to be treated. Mm-hmm. You know, it's really easy though, like to kind of get distracted. You know, like if you you spend all day trying to fill these spots, you know, on the schedule for the next tour or the you know whatever, and you spend all day like begging people to do overtime and covering all these vacancies, and then the th- you know you finally filled it, mm-hmm. and then somebody calls in sick. You know, like your I instinct is to yell at them. You <laughs> know, yeah. but it's really you know it's not their fault. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's the fault of the fact that we have like a massive shortage of people, and mm-hmm. you know, and it's not just people coming to work because it doesn't seem like they take allowances for the fact that people do get hurt on this job yeah. like crazy, yeah. and people really you're dealing with sick people like you're going to use your sick time, you know, and yeah. if you're not using your sick time, I feel like it, you're maybe not around enough sick people, yeah. you know, because really that's what we do. We deal with people with infectious diseases who wait till the last minute to get treated. And, you know, after you work mm. 20 um, extra hours on top of your regular shift, your immune system takes a beating and it, it's kind of not unexpected <laughs> to yeah, utilize yeah. your sick time. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's kind of like, um, you know, people are just banging into the, the beach and like the outcome is still the same for me anyway like i don't yeah you know if you call me i don't really want to hear your excuse because if you're lying i don't care because either way i'm stuck with a vacancy (laughs) you know and you can use your sick time maybe you need it for that mental health day because you didn't get an extra hour after dealing with the the horribly burned person that's gonna sit in your brain for the rest of your life you know and so what do you do to decompress (laughs) <laughs> well, besides, yeah, you know, know. James, who is <laughs> beating up your husband? <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I don't. I think like you know, just you're pretty famous. Huh? Oh, because there's some you know camaraderie and stuff like that. Yeah. I think I've always felt that like after something terrible happened, like like when our friend uh, killed himself, they sent like um, uh, this mental CSU over, and they were strangers, and we didn't know who they were. Yeah. They didn't know him, and it was kind of just better the fact that you just hang out with your friends yep. and talk about stuff. And, you know, I felt that that was much better than, yeah. you know, just dealing with a regimen for you. This is how you're supposed to process grief and, you know, and, and talking mm-hmm. about it, you know, in front of somebody with certain parameters as opposed to just, you know. <laughs> it's always helped me out anyway. Yeah. I don't know. I just feel like um, the outside, you have to have a life outside of work. Yeah. And, you know, even if you're outside of work, is like the cat. 
you know, like yeah. <laughs> that yeah. was a great distraction for me, it was. <laughs> you know, yeah. because she was something else to concentrate so on. Tell us about your cat real quick. Oh, killer. Well, yeah, you're, well you have a couple uh, cats, right? Yeah, well, now we have, we're trying to replace killer, <laughs> you know, but killer was a great like animal. It just showed up one day at the station so and uh, became a station mascot. Yeah, okay. and she became pretty famous on Instagram and um, she had a massive following and she just, you know, it's kind of funny because she wasn't very popular, which is why I set up the Instagram account for her. Mm. And uh, I felt like people didn't understand them, you know, because a lot of people don't understand, like, the way cats are. And, like, they're not really being mean. They're just scared. Mm. You know, a lot of stuff that they do is because they're scared and they're trying to defend their little tiny bodies from yeah. huge, huge people. And so, you know, I gave her a voice and uh, I tried to make little funny comments on her. And she developed a huge, huge following, which... Um, People used to visit her at the station. People yep. send gifts constantly. And it was really, like, nice. And I felt like the outside world got to see what life inside of an EMS station was through Instagram, through the cat, you know, because they got to see that we don't sit around at the station all that much and that there's never anybody there, you know, as opposed to, like, there's a couple of famous fire cats as well that the same people yep. follow and that they could see that they were, there were always more people at the firehouse, even though there's only, like, a yeah. Like there's yeah. Carlo's never alone. Yeah, yeah. Carlo. Yeah, yeah. yeah right. exactly. Like, and like at our station, they you know sometimes it's empty. Sometimes it's just me and the cat. You know, yeah. and mm -hmm. um, you know, it's just uh, you know they got to see how you know stuff worked with us, and I think they got to understand more. Like a lot, a lot of more people understand that the fire department wasn't just firemen; that there were EMTs and paramedics, and that it was a separate station, and that we did things a little differently. And uh, I felt it was a good educational tool. <laughs> And then when she died, like, it was um, the outpouring from around the world was crazy. You know, like, it was it was wonderful. And I, I felt like I was losing all these people when the account, she, you know, like, when she, you know, I was like, oh, I'm not going to be able to do this anymore. That, you know, I'm going to lose all these friends, you yeah. know, because some of them, like, I became personal friends with some of them. And some of them, you know, just through their messages and through their, you know, their experiences, because fire departments around the world ask for there was a fire department in California that asked for help with their cat because okay. they were getting the boot. I yeah. believe she ended up doing Oh, yeah, that was Edna, a cat from San fire Francisco, cat Edna, right? Yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, so um, I posted on, on Killer's page, and, you know, her followers just went on this letter-writing phone call campaign to get this animal, yeah. <laughs> you know, to stay. And, uh, you know, it didn't really work, though. But, yep. you know, <laughs> so now we have, you know, two new little guys that seem to be so we had some um, some prospects. Yeah, yeah. We have two little brothers. What was that, that cute one we had that everybody got itchy? Oh, oh, um, Buff. His, Buff. His, his name ended up being Buff. Yeah. Because he was a kitten. He got everybody itchy. Yeah. And, and he didn't make the cut. <laughs> <laughs> and he was a baby. Like, uh, it's not a good idea to get a kitten. Because no. they, they just run into things. Yeah, and you don't want them to get hurt, like, yeah. running under an ambulance yeah. or something. Yeah. yeah. Our new guys are savvy. Well, yeah. <laughs> We've been at it for a little bit over an hour, maybe about an hour and a half, oh. so we got to oh, wow. kind of wrap <laughs> up. But okay. Yeah. So I know, it's all gone. Yeah, it's time to go all gone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I know. But, uh, but thank you for, you. for oh, coming no down thank and being you. the first guest on Rush the Bus. This is oh, awesome. Thank you. I mean, yeah. Thanks, Nan. I know, thank, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> and James. Oh, yes. Oh, James you. in the background. You don't have to pump gas, so while you're here, <laughs> get some gas. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. The best thing about New Jersey. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Do they clean your windows, too? Uh, that's a question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you go to H well, Hess used to. Because full service Hess. used to imply they changed your, yeah, they checked I, your sometimes oil. Sometimes I don't yes. want them. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of like if somebody in Brooklyn was like, I'll clean your window, mister. Like, yeah. no, it's good. Uh, I, I don't even do that anymore. But, uh, well, uh, everybody, oh, thanks for, for oh, tuning thank in. You. This is um, Rob with Julie and Peter and oh, I guess you. Nancy. Oh, thank you. Rush <laughs> the bus. Thanks for having us. And oh, thank uh, you. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll see everybody out there. All right. oh, thank All right. you.